In May of 1941, Major Cigna Gilkey was flying a prototype model of the Lockheed P-38 Lightning, one of the world's fastest fighters, in the middle of the Second World War. It would be less than a year before the United States went to war with the Japanese and Germany, and America was already supplying Britain in the war against the Nazi Empire. But his aircraft was about to terrifyingly defy all that was known about how a plane was supposed to fly, and the implications of these discoveries would last for decades. Gilkey was flying at high speed when the tail began to shake, and the aircraft suddenly and inexplicably began to die. Gilkey pulled hard to try and stop the dive, but nothing happened. The aircraft continued to dive almost vertically at high speed. Gilkey was able to use the elevator trim to just barely pull out before hitting the ground, and he landed safely. No one seemed to know what had happened to the plane. This was not an isolated incident. Many P-38 test pilots lost their aircraft or their lives in high-speed crashes, and other fighters of the era noted strong buffeting and pitch-down tendencies at high speeds. Another P-38 pilot, Ralph Verdon, had the tail of his aircraft get torn off by the forces of an attempt to pull out of a high-speed dive by brute force. P-51 Mustangs that flew too fast in dives suffered severe flutter and buffeting problems. Aerodynamicists and wind tunnel engineers scrambled to figure out what was going on, and found that these tendencies occurred at certain percentages of the speed of sound, or, Mach number. For example, the P-51's dive vibration became dangerous at about Mach 0.85, or 85% the speed of sound. So why do aircraft encounter buffeting and peculiar control conditions at certain Mach numbers? It's because these aircraft exceeded something called critical Mach number, in a condition called compressibility. When a wing moves through the air, the air has to accelerate to travel a longer path around the wing. When the aircraft is at a certain Mach number, the speed the air needs to go in order to get around the wing exceeds the speed of sound. This creates a bubble of supersonic flow on top of the wing, and when that air returns to subsonic speed, it passes through a shockwave in the process. This shockwave that pops up at the critical Mach number is the cause of all kinds of problems. The formation of the shock can increase drag by nearly 10 times, and it disturbs airflow, which causes a region of flow separation and turbulence behind it. This causes a lot of buffeting and the turbulent air can wash over the control surfaces and render them completely ineffective. In addition, the shock changes the lift distribution on the wing, creating nose-up or nose-down trim tendencies. These compressibility effects often combined to force transonic World War II fighters into violent, buffeting dives that could not be recovered. These issues, obviously, needed to be addressed before more pilots died in transonic dives. In the case of the P-38, Lockheed engineers tried everything from trim tabs to an upward-angled tailplane. Wind tunnel data suggested that a movable stabilizer would be the best solution, but there wasn't time to implement it on the production design. The final solution were dive flap kits that changed the lift distribution at high speeds, preventing a high-speed dive. Unfortunately, these were not delivered to operational units before P-38s had to engage in combat with Axis forces. Therefore, pilots' manuals had charts detailing airspeed and dive limitations at various altitudes to avoid exceeding the P-38's critical Mach number. Pilots of other aircraft with critical Machs closer to Mach 0.8 were simply warned to be careful about their airspeed in dives, lest their aircraft be destroyed by buffeting. Speed performance was vital in aerial operations of the Second World War. The ME-262 jet airplane, with a top speed over 100 miles per hour faster than propeller-driven fighters, was very difficult to combat. It was impossible to catch and was hard to shoot because of its speed. Dive speed was also critical, largely for the same reasons, but with compressibility, fighters seemed to have hit a brick wall. Nowhere was this more apparent than on the P-38. German pilots were quick to note that early model P-38s were not allowed to dive due to their low critical Mach number, and exploited it. All the German pilots had to do was dive away from their enemies and they'd be unable to follow, making them very hard to shoot down. That combined with engine issues was the final nail in the coffin for the P-38 in Europe. The aircraft was replaced in European long-range fighter operations with the P-51 Mustang. 
The Mustang, with compressibility onset occurring at a speed higher by 0.15 Mach due to a laminar flow wing design, was far better in dives. Even still, they had to be careful in high-speed dives not to exceed Mach 0.85, and drag divergence at high Mach numbers limited their top speed. And the ME262, with a slightly swept wing and jet engines, was capable of far higher speeds, and proved an incredible threat. Part of it was due to the slight wing sweep, originally implemented for weight and balance reasons, which increased the critical Mach number. But that was the least of what the Germans were developing. The Germans already knew how swept and delta wings worked at speeds beyond Mach 1, and they had transonic fighter jets capable of nearly Mach 1 well on the way. But these, Wunderwaffen, would never be. A German team was the first to fly a jet-powered aircraft in 1939, and the Germans thereafter led the field in, obviously secret, research into fast aircraft. By 1939 they had already tested the swept wing in wind tunnels and confirmed the reduction in drag, and by 1940 they were testing supersonic wind tunnels. To take advantage of this data and the new technology of the turbojet engine, several German aircraft builders created designs for jet-powered transonic fighters. The Blohm and Voss P215 and Fop Wolf TA183 were both highly advanced designs, using swept wings and a new generation of turbojets to reach speeds over Mach 0.9. But they were never built. By the time these concepts were entering the design phase, the Allies were on German home soil. Germany's factories and industrial capabilities were all but destroyed due to relentless Allied bombing. The end of the war was just weeks away. Even the ME-262, which entered production and was devastatingly effective against Allied aircraft, was only produced in limited numbers. Its engines had to be built with low-quality metals and frequently melted. There were concepts for versions of the ME-262 with higher wing sweep, but they were never built either. The war ended before any of these concepts moved beyond wind tunnel tests. The research data collected by the Germans wouldn't go to waste. In the wake of the capture of Berlin, thousands of documents and tens of engineers were captured by the Americans and the Soviets. And one thing became extremely clear, the age of straight-winged propeller-driven fighters was over. Propellers could only drive a plane so fast, and straight-winged aircraft were obviously far outperformed by swept-wing versions. By the 1950s, the Russians had created the MiG-15, likely descended from the TA-183, and in 1955 the Soviets introduced the MiG-19 into service. Descended from the MiG-15, the MiG-19 was capable of 1.3 times the speed of sound, and was the first supersonic fighter jet in the world to enter mass production. Compressibility was a brick wall that led to World War II engineers creating the concept of the sound barrier. But that concept proved flawed, with enough power and the right kind of wing, you can fly much, much faster than the speed of sound. By the 1960s the sound barrier was no more, and nowadays a supersonic aircraft is merely another engineering challenge. Make no mistake, though, aircraft not designed for supersonic flight will still suffer from compressibility, buffet, and mock tuck, even today. These effects can be mitigated, but it requires deliberate design and piloting.